Now, let's talk about the six things that narcissists do when you try to go no contact, which I highly recommend that you do. And I've had to do it myself with a couple of narcissists. It's never fun. It's never great. They uh, try to make it almost impossible. They try to make it so that you really don't want to have to do that. But you definitely do have to do that because they will eventually take over your soul. Like literally, I describe it as like pods. I know there was some movie like, you know, I don't know if it was in the 60s or something like a long time ago, where like these pods like came and sat down next to people and like, took all of their like, information and like, basically took over their bodies. And that's how I feel about narcissists. Like they're these odds that just come into your life and steal you. Um, and you end up feeling like you, you, you're like being choked to death or like, I don't know, my situation um, where I talked a lot about this, by the way, in a couple of recent videos, one was my toxic relationships. And the other one was, I don't normally share this, my own story of bullying. But like in my situation, I felt like one of the narcissists was literally trying to like become me, like, like stand in my shoes and be me. And, but also like was devaluing me and doing things to me at the same time. It was super weird and really awful. Um, and so that's kind of how you start to feel. Right. And so you have to go no contact in order to like, I feel. I, it, it's like not too dramatic. I don't think to say like, save your soul. Like that's how I felt. So, but you do want to know what's going to happen when you go to do that. Right. So um, let's talk about that now. So the first thing is that they're going to maybe try to start going back to what worked for them before, because remember there's those three different ways of, that they're, you know, that they interact in relationships. There's the three different phases, which is love bombing, devaluing, and discarding. And by the way, I have videos on each one of those if you want to go check them out. But they start off with love bombing or that idealization phase where they show up, whether it's, you know, it's not always a romantic. It can be a business situation, which it was for me. Um, and they, they show up in your space and they seem like they're absolutely perfect. And then they start to devalue you. And then, you know, there's the discard phase, but they kind of go back and forth between the phases. So they're going to go back to what worked before, you know, oh, you know, we can always work this out. We've always been so good together. We've always been able to do things. You know, why do you need to be so rigid? Why do you need to be so difficult? Um, you know, try to like get you to be charmed by them again, you know, whatever that worked before to charm them, they'll go back to that. And sometimes it's called hoovering, where they're basically coming back and saying, oh, you know, maybe they haven't talked to you in a while. And, and, and suddenly you get that ping in your, in your inbox and, or in your DMs or whatever. And you're like, oh, I haven't talked to that person in a while. What are they doing here? Um, so, you know, they're going to go back to trying to charm you in some way. So that's number one. The next thing is that they may try to escalate their tactics, like come on even stronger, you know, uh, like you barely feel like you can breathe sometimes with them. Like now all of a sudden they're showing up at your house, they're showing up at, their, at your office. They happen to be talking to everybody that you know, like you just can't get away from this person. There they are. They may call you incessantly. They may text you incessantly. Uh, they may escalate their efforts on all the bad things that they're doing, manipulating situations, projection, denial, deflection, um, lying, all the things that they normally do, but now on steroids. Um, because remember with the narcissist, you're either for them or against them. There's, they're, they're very black and white, you know? So they may escalate their taxes. You see like them coming on much more strongly. Um, and then the third thing that they will likely do when you go no contact is start that triangulation, which is kind of, you know, in the discard phase, that's when you start to see the birth of the smear campaign. So they'll, they'll escalate even the triangulation, meaning that they're lining up their, they're lining up their flying monkeys. They're talking to people that, you know, they, they want you to feel excluded. They want you to feel isolated. They want you to be punished for going no contact with them. So they want you to think that they're doing great 
and and you are making a huge mistake by going no contact with them. Um, that they're going to have everybody in your world against you and everyone's going to line up for them and everyone's going to think you're the crazy one or you're the bad one or maybe you're the narcissist and um, and they'll, they'll try to divide you in that way. So, you know, isolate you, manipulate situations, triangulates that smear campaign. So that's like kind of all goes into number three um, as far as like triangulation smear campaign and um, you know, lining up flying monkeys against you. So that's the third thing. And if any of you have seen this before, I want you to tell me I've seen it in the comments below, because I'm sure you've totally seen this before. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the fourth thing. So the fourth thing is that their narcissistic injury could be triggered. And so therefore that narcissistic rage comes flying out. So now they're not just trying to hoover you. They're not just pushing you more. They're not just triangulating. They're not just escalating. Um, now it's like they're in full on rage. Like you will do what I want. You will come back. You know, you will be punished. And sometimes I think they go into this rage state just so that you're afraid, just so that you are punished. Not not just that they're angry. I mean, I know that they're angry too. You know, they're like two-year-olds in adult in, in adult body. So they're literally having a tantrum now. They're literally like super angry. And sometimes during this phase, that's when they start to actually become undone. They start to make mistakes. And, and that's when you know you're starting to close in on them. And, you know, in a negotiation setting, that's when you know that your tactics are actually starting to work. And that's when you are actually the most vulnerable to going, oh my God, I don't think I have the stomach for this. But that's when you gotta keep going because narcissists are always the worst right before they're ready to give up. And I do have a whole video on the undoing of a narcissist, which I broke down the show, that Hugh Grant show. That's a really great example of a malignant narcissist who was like, continuing to do things but the more people figured out who he was the more mistakes he started to make and that became his undoing so that leads me to number five which is the narcissistic collapse which sometimes they do they completely collapse they just become undone they don't know what to think about their world because you know they do have a very fragile sense of self you know, for them, the world is a place of survival, that they have to survive. And so sometimes they do collapse. And that's number five. And the last thing is that eventually, eventually, if you do it the right way, and you create the right strategy, and you have the right leverage, and you, you figure out how to cut off any source of supply from you, that means you're not intimidated, you're not scared, your fear goes away, all of that, because now they just realize they're not getting any supply from you anymore at all. And you know, they're like vultures. So they, like, there's nothing left in this carcass over here. So they will eventually, and this is number six, go find narcissistic supply somewhere else because they have to have it. It is what they feed on, it's their lifeblood, it's their oxygen. But you just want to make sure that you are no longer a source of that narcissistic supply for them. So eventually your no contact will absolutely work. So how does a narcissist handle rejection or no contact? Well, as I said, not well. And it may be, that may actually be an understatement because the thing with narcissists is that they have no inner sense of value. They need to get all of their value from the external and how they do that is in the form of what we call narcissistic supply. So they're going to try to suck supply from everywhere that they possibly can. And the only reason why they attach themselves to people is because they're looking to feed that beast, that, that never ending black hole that's inside of them that must be fed with narcissistic supply. So narcissistic supply is that external sense of value that they try to cover up their inner sense of fragility and having no 
no value and that tiny little ego that's inside of them, they try to lather a big cover up on top of it. And they do that in the form of narcissistic supply. So supply can be anything in the form of compliments, money, big house, big car, the right spouse, the, the right friends, living in the right place, um, the huge bank account, big uh, salary, um, all of those kinds of things feed a narcissist's ego and, and gives them that external sense of value that they so desperately need. The other form of narcissistic supply can also be um, devaluing somebody, de debasing them, degrading them, cutting them down, judging them, uh, making them squirm. All of those things, you know, delight the narcissist in a way because it, it gives them a sense of control. It makes them feel like they're better than you. And so that also feeds that beast, that necessary beast of feeling that they need for endless supply. So when a narcissist chooses a target, uh, which by the way, if you think that you might be a target of a narcissist, you should definitely check out my video on are you a narcissist magnet? And I'll drop a link to that below. But if you are a narcissist magnet and you have been a target or a victim, of a narcissist, then you should know that the reason why they selected you, they chose you, is because they felt that they could get supply from you. So a lot of times they choose empaths, they choose people who are kind, who are considerate, who are very loving, who are going to be willing to help them in some way, and they're, 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 they're saying, okay, I can get value from this person. Because remember, your value to a narcissist is just the value that you can bring to them. It ha doesn't have anything to do with, you know, giving you anything. It's like, okay, how can I suck value out of this person? It, it, you know, it might be that you look the right way or that you come from the right people or that you know the right people or, or that you have the right status or, or whatever it is, this, you know, because they, they can't, connect on a real level. They can't truly feel empathy or care for another person. So they just want to know, what can you do for me? So your value to a narcissist is just the value that you bring to them. And as long as you're bringing value to them, then you get to stay in their space. If you're no longer bringing value to them, then they really don't have any use for you. But they can be discarding you and still have use for you because they can make you squirm. So if you turn around and you reject that narcissist and you go no contact, you are basically cutting off their supply. And so it's not going to go well for them or you actually, mostly for you, uh, because they have this narcissistic injury and that injury is, is that scab, that little inner person, that, that frightened child, because something happened to a narcissist at some point in their life, it, it, probably their childhood, which caused them to have trauma and broke, broke something inside of their head. And um, there's that, that, that little bit of narcissistic, that, that narcissistic injury is inside that little person. And so what happens is, when somebody leaves a narcissist and um, and tr triggers that 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 narcissistic injury is 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 inflamed in some way, then it can trigger narcissistic rage, and narcissistic narcissistic rage looks like I'm pretty sure you know what it looks like, but it can look like it, it, basically an adult having a two year old tantrum you know, um, screaming, yelling, intimidation tactics, lying about you, smear campaigns, going after you. And, and if they are, if they're a covert narcissist, they're going to be lining up their flying monkeys, trying to get everybody against you. Um, gas, all for all, all narcissists, you know, dealing gaslighting. Um, if you want to know more about that, you should check out my video on gaslighting techniques. But the other thing that they're going to do is potentially violence, stalking, 
threats of violence, especially if they are a malignant narcissist. A malignant narcissist is the scariest form of narcissists. And I have a video on that that you're going to want to check out too. They're the ones that actually have an overlay of an antisocial personality and paranoia. And um, so they tend to be e even take rejection or no contact so much worse. So one thing that you should know is that rejection is the thing that narcissists fear the most. That's the one thing they do not want to happen to them. And so if you reject them, then that's like in some ways the worst thing that could possibly happen for them because you're taking away, you're snatching away that, that, that oxygen that they need, that, that narcissistic supply, you're taking it from them. And, and they, they really think that that's the worst thing that you could possibly do. So they're probably going to go after you. Or they might just try to punish you in other ways. But punishment is definitely something that they are going to want to be plotting. They're going to want to get you back. They're going to want to make sure you pay for, you know, making them look bad in any way, shape, or form or, or rejecting them. How could you possibly do that? And if this sounds like you and you're dealing with a narcissist in your life and you are so ready to get them out of your life, give me an I'm ready in the comments. If you're lucky, the narcissist might just never speak to you again and maybe they think that's your punishment. If that happens to you, thank your lucky stars because most narcissists don't take rejection and no contact in that way. Um, as many of you know who've watched a lot of my videos, I've had to deal with a couple of narcissists in my own life not as husbands, thank God, but as people who were close enough to me to wreak havoc and cause damage. And I know for me, you know, what they ended up doing is, you know, I try to go no contact myself, uh, which is something I highly recommend that you do, is go no contact as fast as you possibly can. But then you're, you're going to experience all of these things. And remember when I tell you this, that narcissists are the worst right before they're getting ready to give up. But sometimes their ego, they, they, they think they look more confident by going after you. And, and so I know in my own life, I've had to deal with a couple of covert narcissists. And so they felt entitled to do certain things uh, to me or go through other people to try to get to me or, or get me, you know, riled up or get me upset about things. Um, you know, one of them was an extended member of my family. And so, you know, tried to use family members to go after me in certain ways. And, and you know, it's just, it, it, it's not pleasant. It's not fun. It's awful to deal with. But it's definitely worse to continue to have that narcissist in your life. And please remember that narcissists are very clever. They, they know how to bring you in. They know how to love bomb you. That's what they did in the first place to love bomb you. And so they're, they're going to try to do whatever they can to love bomb you back in. Oh, you know, come on back. Things are going to be different. It's going to be better. Um, because even if they were on the verge of rejecting you, they can't reject, be rejected. They don't want to be the ones be, being rejected. So they may try to, figure out a way to claw their way back into your life. Don't fall for it. Don't buy it. Just keep on walking, move forward. You know, Maya Angelou said, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. So once you've already seen how they can be, don't expect them to change. They can't. They can't be rehabilitated. They can pretend to be behave. They know what good behavior looks like. It doesn't mean that you're going to get them to actually care and have empathy. So there's a lot of people in this world, seven and a half billion people, find other people to hang out with, find other people to be around. So when it's time to reject that narcissist and go no contact, expect these types of behaviors, but just hold firm because you can do this. Just hang on, don't give in, don't give up, just keep on walking. So now let's talk about the difference between silent treatment, no contact, and ghosting. So all three are things that are you experience when you're dealing with narcissists. But 
uh, two of them are done by the narcissist and one of them is done by you, the victim or the target of the narcissist's abuse or behavior. So let's talk first about silent treatment. So silent treatment is something that the narcissist uses in order to gain control over you. It's something that they do to make you upset, to make you squirm. Remember that the narcissist is doing whatever they can to get control over you because that gives them a form of narcissistic supply. If you want to know more about narcissistic supply, you should definitely check out my video on narcissistic supply. Basically what it is, is anything that feeds a narcissist ego. And I kind of liken it to almost like the tip of the iceberg kind of a thing because the stuff that feeds a narcissist's ego that you can see on top of the, the iceberg is the stuff that would feed anybody's ego because who doesn't like getting compliments or respect or pr having prestigious you know, life or friends or a nice house or whatever it is. So those are sort of like the, the things that first come to mind when people think, oh, feed their ego. That's what they want. They want to, you know, compliments and they, they want their ego to be fluffed up in some way. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Because remember that in some ways, you, you could say that we all have narcissistic traits or tendencies, but I don't really call it that. I know some people do. I don't really call it that because a narcissist to me is all the way at the end of the spectrum. It's a person who is pathologically in need of anything that feeds their ego. All human beings want to feel seen, heard, and know that we matter. That's why my book is called Negotiate Like You Matter. When I wrote the book, I didn't specifically address narcissists throughout the entire book. I, I do reference uh, narcissists some, but when you're dealing with a narcissist, what you're really dealing with is somebody who has no sense of self. They need to get as much out of the, the people around them as they can, almost like squeezing lemons or sucking blood. Um, you know, that's why sometimes they're called energy vampires or I've, I, I remember when I was dealing with narcissists, I, I remember feeling like they were leeches. And that was just the only word I could come up with was like leeches or parasites. And they almost want to become you. And so that's why sometimes you find them like staring at you or watching you. And if you want to know more about that creepy narcissist stare, check out my video on why the narcissist is always watching you. Because... Uh, that's part of what it is that they're doing. They kind of want, almost want to become you in some ways. So they, they, because they have no sense of self. So the rest of that iceberg is the other stuff, what I call the dark underbelly, the, the part that they don't show the world. And that is that they get narcissistic supply from treating people poorly, from being scary, from uh, intimidating you, gaslighting you, uh, uh, projection, denying, deflection, control tactics, smear campaigns, flying monkeys. It's this whole nasty tox toxic stew that you're subjected to and it becomes really, really traumatic and difficult to, to get out of once, once they, they start that that toxic stew formula on you. So that's what's happening when the, to feed their ego, to feed their narcissist, their need for narcissistic supply. So when they give you the silent treatment, it's actually just a form of trying to control you. So they are stopping talking to you, you know, via text or email or whatever, like they're at work or, they, or maybe you live in separate places and all of a sudden you can't get in touch with them. And so that they, they have this, they're giving you the silent treatment 
and it's to try to get you to come back and grovel and say, oh, please talk to me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I, I was... Um, you know, I shouldn't have said that, you know, they want you to beg, uh, to get back into their, their web of control. And they, they love that. They love to see you squirm that way. That totally gets them that narcissistic supply that they so deeply need to, that they so deeply crave. And closely related to the silent treatment is ghosting. But ghosting is actually when they, they're ready to be done and they're just gone. And uh, now all of a sudden you just never hear from them again. And that will happen when they don't feel like there's any source of supply left that they can squeeze out of you. So they just move on to other sources of supply. As long as they think that there are some form of supply for them to squeeze out of you, even if they've long moved on to other sources of supply, they'll come back. Uh, and, and the supply doesn't necessarily mean that they think that you're going to tell them how wonderful they are. It means as long as they think that they can scare you, control you, intimidate you, jerk you around, treat you poorly, make you feel intimidated, all of those things, they will continue to come back into your space. Or, or maybe just being attached to you in some way gives them some sort of... Um, prestige or just, you know, because you're, maybe you're more powerful than they are just getting your attention uh, sometimes is all they want. So, um, but that's when they're coming back and they're hoovering and all that sort of thing. So ghosting just means they're gone and you never hear from them again. And that just means that you're no longer a good source of supply for them. And if you are ready to get out of this narcissistic relationship today, give me a today in the comments. Okay, so now let's talk about going no contact. This is something that you do as the narcissist victim, so or the target of the narcissistic abuse. And this is something that you do to protect yourself to put up boundaries, to stop that narcissistic abuse, to say, it's not okay anymore. I'm ready to move on and I'm ready to, to take control back of my life. So one is done, you know, ghosting or, um, or silent treatment, they're used to by the narcissist as a weapon. Whereas you are actually using going no contact as a shield, as a barrier, as a protection for yourself, where you're actually just saying, I'm, it's not okay anymore. I'm blocking you on my phone. I'm blocking you on, on, on my social media. And I, I just don't, I don't want to see what you're doing. I don't want you to see what I'm doing. I don't want to interact with you anymore. I want to erase you from the CPU of my life. I don't want to have to deal with you ever again. And um, that's what I had to do with narcissists in my life. And, you know, I still have to deal with them popping up every once in a while, unfortunately. And, but I keep up super strong boundaries and I try to keep it to a very, very bare minimum, um, which is why I don't even mention who they are in these videos because I don't want them coming back. I want them to stay away and I would like to wipe them from the CPU of my life as if they never existed. They never came into my life. They never came into my world. And I highly recommend that you do the same. All right. So eight ways to move on from narcissists. The first thing you have to do now, remember, You've been conditioned from the beginning. You've been love bomb. You've been charmed. They come along. They are the most charming, incredible people on the planet. Seriously, they know how to become exactly what it is that you need to see because they've been reading you from the beginning. The reason why they know how to do that is because they started off from the time that they were children as needing this as a survival skill. I say 
you know, like Malcolm Gladwell's like 10,000 hours to achieve mastery, right? They had like their, their 10,000 hours by the time when they were like 10 years old, because this is a survival skill for them to be able to read people, to be able to come, become exactly what they need you to be, or you need them to be rather. So they've been conditioning you from the beginning. So the first thing you need to do is go no contact. And that's like the hardest thing to do. So I say step one, don't run, go no contact right away, because you are shutting down the fumes, you're shutting down that toxic energy, that toxic stuff that's in your in your air. I, I saw somebody talking one time about this analogy of somebody, and it's kind of gross, so I'm just going to go there, okay? But it is kind of gross, but I, I have to go there. This analogy of somebody peeing in your pool, right? Like if you were standing in your own pool or your own hot tub or whatever, and somebody peed in it, you'd be like, that's disgusting. Get out and don't ever come here ever again. But that's kind of what they're doing. It's like that toxic stuff like there. And you got to get it away from you. So you, you've got to go no contact so that you can start to clean up that energy so you can start to feel better. Part of the way that you do that is, I'm going to say, go to number two, which is to start to set boundaries for yourself. All right. So how do you set boundaries? Well, one of the ways that you can set boundaries for yourself is to have one form of communication. Because one of the things that is going to happen when you decide to move on is that they're going to just go insane because they realize that they're losing a form of narcissistic supply. They're losing their grip on you. The difference between you as a person and you as a possession because they don't care about you as a person. They're going to love bomb you and they're going to make it seem like they care about you as a person, but they don't care about you as a person. They're going to go after you as a possession. Oh, there goes my form of supply. There goes what I need. They need you to be filling that, that hole for them. They don't care about you as a, a person. They don't care about your needs or ever satisfying your needs. So they're, but they're going to light you up. They're going to show up at your house or office. They're going to be sending you all kinds of emails. They're going to be guilt tripping you. They're going to be flooding your inbox. They're going to be flooding your emails, flooding your flooding your texts. They're going to go crazy on you and they're going to guilt trip you and they know exactly the things to say. And you just, you can't allow that to happen. So you've got to like winnow it down to one form of communication and you've, you've got to allow yourself to have that space to heal and the communication, if you're having any communication at all, you know, I, I say no communication at all, but if you're, if you have to communicate with this person, then it's got to be only one form of communication. And, you know, it's only about the kids or it's only about work or it's only about this particular topic. So how do you set those boundaries? You pretend like you're reporting the news. Basically, you, you don't explain, you don't justify, you don't defend yourself. You don't, you don't need to go point by point by point and explain every single thing. If they send you this whole long email on every single thing, accusing you of everything under the sun, you can just say, I deny that. I deny everything you said there. That's all you need to say. And then you can just go through and pick out the one thing that you need to respond to and that's it. And I, you know, I recommend that if you have to correspond, you use email or you use, if you have children, you can use one of those apps that you want something that has a time and date stamp. You want something that can't be manipulated. 
texts can be easily manipulated and they don't have a time date stamp. Okay. So those are the first two ways that you can start to move on. The next way that you can start to move on is, is start to get educated, start to get educated, start to get information, start to get all the knowledge that you can, because the more knowledge that you start to gain, the, the more that you start to realize, hey, this wasn't me. This was them. And you start to realize this was a person that was broken. And you'll start to realize, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't need to take this personally because I, I know that I have value. And the faster you start to recognize that, the faster you will start to heal. So start to gain knowledge, start to get educated, start to understand narcissism, start to understand whatever it is that you need to understand, whatever it is the process is that you need to understand, right? So if you are getting ready to go into a negotiation, start understanding that process. If you know Whatever it is that you need to start educating yourself on, that's the next step of what you need to do. Okay. The next thing that you need to do is start documenting absolutely everything. Document, document, document absolutely everything. Document everything that you need to document because you, you definitely are going to be needing to protect yourself. Remember, that, you know, they're going to try to trigger you. They're going to try to do things to try to get under your skin. Anticipate that. Start creating a strategy. Start creating your leverage. That's my slay methodology, right? So strategy, leverage, anticipate, focus on you. It works. It absolutely works. And remember, your leverage is going to be thinking about your diamond level supply and your coal level supply. What's going to be more important for a narcissist to protect and defend than the, the supply that they get? From jerking you around, right? And and that's how you develop it. And you know, that's what I teach you in my slay program. And by the way, if you don't have access to a support system, you know, we do offer that in my free Facebook group, you know, so make sure you join that. You know, you definitely want to have access to support. And and we do have a sponsor on this channel, which is BetterHelp. And you can go to betterhelp.com forward slash slash Rebecca Zung to get that help if you need it, because we just want you to have access to the help and support that and guidance that you need, something that you can trust. We get commissions on that. It doesn't cost you any extra. So that's the next thing. The next thing that you're going to want to do is start to visualize, start to visualize the things that you actually want? Where is it that you want to go? What is it that you actually want to do? What is it that you want from your life? Because, you know, a lot of times people don't think about that. When you're dealing with a narcissist, you know, you, you spent so much time defending yourself, you, you forget to actually think about what it is that you want. And you, you've been erased for so long, too, that you kind of almost forgot about the fact that you get to have needs, you get to have wants, you get to have thoughts for yourself. Because they didn't allow that for you for so long either, too. So this is your moment. This is your moment to get to go, wow, I get to have a life. And I get to think about the great things in my life. And, you know, somebody recently said to me that he was going to think about the majors in his life instead of the minors in his life. And I thought that was such a beautiful thought. The majors in his life are the big Fs, he said, instead of the small things. So, you know, family and finances and, you know, like the, the major amazing things in his life, right? So think about the big things in your life that matter to you the most. 
that matter to you the most, you know, and for him, he included philanthropy in that. It's like an F sound, you know, and, and he considered, you know, all of the major things in his life that matter to him the most. So if you think about the things in your life that matter to you the most, write those down and start visualizing those things. What matters to you the most and, and start writing them out and start creating a plan for that. And then the next thing is, I want you to think about taking time to allow yourself to be okay with being sad, be okay with being angry, be okay with sitting with your feelings. So I'm going to just say, allow yourself to go, I'm going to just be okay with whatever it is that I feel. Because you know what? The only way out is through. And you, you can't rush that. You can't rush that. I just had a whole conversation with somebody who was had dealt with a lot of trauma in, a, in many different ways because of a husband, because of several different things. And she was, you know, kind of upset with herself because she felt like she should be further along. And I reminded her it had only been like, six months since certain things had happened, you know, with her husband and with other things. And she was like, you know what? You're right. It has only been six months, you know? So allow yourself time to process and don't be too hard on yourself. If you're still feeling sad, you're still feeling angry, you're still feeling resentful, you're still feeling like you missed the person. That's okay too. Because, you know, especially if you have had a life with a person for a long time, that's all right. You know, you can sit there and journal out what it is that you're feeling and say, I'm still feeling this or that or whatever. Emotions are tricky things, you know, and things can be triggered by the craziest things too. You know, we can be triggered by a smell. We can be triggered by hearing a song. We can be triggered by seeing somebody that you know. You can be triggered just by seeing an interaction because, you know, our brain is networked, right? And just the familiarity of certain things causes a network of neurons to be engaged. And then there you are, you know, it all gets lit up in there and things start getting fired up and there you are, right? So it's okay to have that happen. So the next thing I'm going to say to you is find your vibe tribe. Find your vibe tribe because that is critically important. Critically important to have that support group. And I started to allude to that a little bit earlier in this where I said, you know, join, join the Facebook group and find, you know, your therapist and that sort of thing. That is just so important, so important to have that vibe tribe, to have that self-care, to find your ways to have your self-care. Because if you don't have ways to take care of yourself, have ways to find your vibe tribe, you're, you're not going to make it because you need support. One of the things that narcissists have done from the beginning is isolate you. And I do have a an inner circle that I definitely invite you to join as well. It's my Slay Inner Circle and the link for that is slayinnercircle.com. You, you want to have a place where you can go, where you can feel accepted, supported, loved. You know, like the old Cheers show, right? Where everybody knows your name. Find your vibe tribe. Find your people. You, you definitely probably are going to want to have some sort of therapy, whether it's from a clergy or a therapist or something, really somebody who can help you with your trauma and, you know, dealing because you, you are in trauma. You are definitely, your body has dealt with a lot of trauma and processing that trauma is so, so important so important. Okay. And then the last thing that I'm going to suggest that you do is find something that you can pivot to. 
find something that when your brain starts to go to the past, I want you to have something that you can immediately pivot to that is your present and your future. That helped me so much. It still helps me. I always joke that I can't leave my thoughts unsupervised. And so I want you to put in the comments right now, pivot, P-I-V-O-T, pivot, because that is so important. That is something that it has been absolutely critical for me. You know, when my thoughts start going into the dark alley of, you know, I, ta I call it the ghetto of my brain, I have to find, you know, the good neighborhood again. And how I do that is I find like the, the good neighborhood, the, the, what am I focusing on? That's creative for me. What am I focusing on that is helping people like making good videos for you guys or, you, you know, doing things that I know serve my purpose in life is doing great things for serving my soul, making me feel better making me feel like I know I'm doing the right thing in the world and not allowing myself to go down the path of I'm in victim mode. Because anytime you allow the narcissist to rent space in your head free, they're not paying for that space. You're allowing yourself to be a victim. Don't, don't give them that space. Don't give them that satisfaction. Move on. It's time to move on. It's time to pivot. It's time for you to slay. It's time for you to be the best version that you can be. And, and giving them any more time, any more space is not the best version of yourself. So the next video I want you to watch is self-care for dealing with narcissists. It's a great video that I did. I have tons and tons and tons of ways that you can engage in self-care and because self-care is so important, so important. You wrote in your book, staying in a relationship with a narcissist just is really and truly not an option. And you listening to us as you're reflecting on everything that Rebecca Zung is, is sharing with you based on her personal experience, her professional experience, and all of this extensive research, the 40 million views on her YouTube channel, like she knows this inside and out. You have this phrase, today is a great day to start negotiating my best life. And if you see yourself reflected in the comments or the stories that Rebecca is talking about, there are things that you say, Rebecca, that you need to stop doing immediately if you want to get out of a narcissistic relationship. What are the things you need to stop doing in order to cut off that supply and get out of there and negotiate for yourself? Yeah. So, Step one, don't run. Step two, make a U-turn. Step three, break free. So in the strategy, which is the first step, you have to have these action steps. So in that first action step, step one, don't run. Stop allowing them to speak to you in a disrespectful manner. I mean, that's the very first step. You know, I know you feel like it's so overwhelming and it's fearful and it's scary and it feels like, oh my God, you're going to have all this backlash. And I know that I, I you know, I, because y you feel like they're going to have that tantrum, right? But that very first boundary can, that very first baby step can be, I'm not going to allow myself to be spoken in, in, to in a way that's disrespectful. That can be your very first step today because you, I know you have to course correct. It's like stop that conditioning, 180 degree turn, right? Stop that conditioning. So the first boundary is that start looking at them as if they are a child having a tantrum on the floor. Start putting that invisible shield down around you and like Superman having, you know, uh, uh, bullets off your chest or Wonder Woman with the gold bracelets. Remember, they didn't attach themselves to you because you have so little value. They attached themselves to you because you had so much. They devalue you because you have so much value. 
So remember that. Start looking at them like that. Stop defending yourself. You know, never explain, justify, or overshare. So, you know, just start looking at them as if they're a third party. Just say, you know, we can discuss this when you have calmed down. Or, you know, I can see that you are upset. I can see that you are angry. Observing their behavior. Let it go by you. Almost like pretend like the words are like looking, you know, you know, whizzing by you. I always say it's sort of like dodgeball. When I was a kid, dodgeball was a big thing, you know. <laughs> so like I always remember like the words are just like, like they're looking at you, hitting the wall. So is that just so I know, because we're going to get a ton of questions, which is, okay, wait. How do I allow myself to not speak? How do I allow myself to hold a boundary and not be disrespected when this person barrages me with texts or yells at me and then I get paralyzed? And you have these essential phrases that you coach people to use to disarm a narcissist and observe the tantrum, acknowledge it, but not let it hit you. Can you share a bunch of those phrases that you coach people to use? Yes. You can say things like, I agree with you. I, I agree with you that we're not going to agree. I agree with you that that's your opinion. You, you can say things like that. You know, I agree with you is always a good one because they kind of hear I agree with you, but just make sure that you follow it up with I agree that that's your opinion. If, you're, if they're saying things like, you know, you're a terrible mother or whatever, you just make sure that I agree that that's your opinion. You know, uh, I your triggers are not my responsibility. You know, you can always say things like that because they, they often say, you know, it's your fault this or your fault that, something like that. But you can always make sure to remove yourself from a situation where you're not being respected. I love these phrases. I understand that's how you feel. Your approach is not working for me. Let's discuss this when you're less emotional or angry. Do you have any coaching for the fact that I think most people are afraid to say that because they're then going to invite narcissistic rage? Mm -hmm. So when you use one of these phrases to connect with your power and to not allow yourself to be disrespected, I understand that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. And then the person raises the stakes and starts raging at you. What would you advise somebody to do that is just starting to practice these boundaries and create boundaries and not run away from the situation? If they feel like they are going to be in harm's way in some way, then they really may need to remove themselves from this same physical space. Okay. You know, there's a saying that says that, you know, if, if you don't want to be a doormat anymore, get up off the floor. And, you know, you train people you condition people on how to treat you and and that's i mean it may sound harsh but it is the absolute truth and narcissists are the the best ones for that that's and that's just the truth the truth of the matter so if they don't change and somebody's either unwilling or too scared to leave right now how can you truly negotiate with somebody like that Well, you can because what I teach works. Rebecca, I just have to say I love the swagger. Well, you can because what I teach works because that makes me believe you. And you're referring to your slay method. And slay is a four-part framework that you follow in the courtroom and in life for dealing with, negotiating with, and winning against a narcissist. Can you explain what SLAY stands for. SLAY stands for Strategy, Leverage, Anticipate, and You. So let's start with the first one, S. What does it stand for? S stands for developing a super strong strategy, which is the first part of that is creating a vision. If you're just trying to communicate in general, if you're just trying to figure out what to do with them, if if you're in a family situation, if you're just trying to, you know, figure out how to um, deal with them in life, if it's your neighbor, if it's it's your tenant, what is it that you want? So many times people are like, I just want them to stop or I just want peace. That's not, that's not a a goal. What you want, you want to be specific about what you want. 
So is there a reason why peace can't be a goal? And let's let's take the example that you either have a mother or a father who is a narcissist. And all you do want is peace. You are not ready to um, become estranged and to remove them from your life. And you want to figure out a strategy that helps you know what your vision is. How do you figure that out? Because, you know, to your point, you always talk about these three C's that you can't change them, you can't control them, and you can't, what's the other one? You can't cause it, control it, or cure it. That's right. You can't cause this, you can't cure it, and you can't control it. And so knowing that, how do you create a vision if it's your mother or your father? Like, what questions do you ask yourself? I still think even if it's your mother or father, you can create a more specific vision around what that relationship should look like for you. I don't want to be triggered all the time. I don't want her or his BS to trigger me or make me feel manipulated. Right. Or even put that in positive terms. Like, you know. <laughs> Do I have to? <laughs> yeah. Put it in positive terms. Okay. What, what does that look like? Right. So, you know, uh, we will see each other X number, number, number of times a year. And during those visits, we will have these kinds of conversations and you know, uh, this is how I will define the relationship. And, you know, I think that you should be uh, more specific like that because I love that. Yeah. I, th- I think that will be because you, you get what you envision in life. Right. So I love that. I love that because you're right. I think you're so conditioned when you're dealing with somebody who's narcissistic to think about it from what you're enduring versus what would you actually want? And a lot of times it's like, I'd like to be able to walk into a school function where my ex is and not feel like I've just left my body in a panic attack. I put that in a negative, but, um, that's a bit, that's a very common one that we, that I noticed is that people dealing with exes and feeling completely enmeshed and triggered and wanting to be able to feel powerful and unaffected anytime I see them. Right. Yeah. Is that positive uh, enough? No, I think it. Okay. I I I love you, Rebecca. (laughs) Help us. I think it should be, I want to be able to walk into a school function and sit next to them and be able to discuss our child together and uh, be happy for our child together and celebrate her together and uh, and go out for pizza together afterwards and 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 laugh together uh, dur- during the show or you know i think that if you can be like really specific like that that it would actually be more beneficial for you beautiful l stands for leverage what does that mean so leverage is where you're actually creating that motivation for the person to want to be you know squeezed and uh and and incentivized to want to come to a resolution with you and in the case of a narcissist it's going to have to be a situation where that diamond level supply is potentially going to be threatened or you know you there are times where you could potentially, what I what I call, you know, fluff for favor, vomit later, you know. So where you're <laughs> fluff for favor, vomit later. Yes, where you sort of fluff up their ego in order to get something, you know, give give them something they want in order to get something you want, um, you know. Because they, I do this all the time with someone in my life, actually. Yes. Now that I'm realizing I. <laughs> I have, I have really developed this strategy. I do deploy a strategy. I'm realizing as you're talking to feed a particular person's ego that they are getting their way, that they are the most important person in the room. And I do that as a manipulation strategy so that I can get what I want. Exactly. 
Just as long as you know that you're only doing it in order to get, you know, what you want. If you have to go shower or vomit later, then, you know, you do the thing. Um, but, you know, it, it's in order to get what you want later. So, um, but m more often than not, what you kind of have to do is use your documentation because they lie so much because they're so careless, frankly, I mean, they don't think you're ever going to keep track of all the different times that they say things that are, um, you know, that they'll say something in a text message, they'll say something in, a, in an email, they'll say, I mean, honestly, they are very irrational. They, as we talked about at the beginning of this show, how many times their memory is faulty or whatever, and, but if you keep track that's how you create your leverage in a negotiation. And you say, hey, um, you said this, you said this, you said this. I am going to present this in court. I call it ethically manipulating the manipulator. You can call it whatever you want. Many times empaths are uncomfortable with that sort of thing. You have to be on the offensive when you are dealing with a narcissist. It's not doing anything other than what works. I mean, it's not um, anything that's, you know, uh, unethical at all. But you have to do the things that are, are offensive. Whereas most empaths are like, I don't want to fight. I just want to resolve this peacefully. Let's just come to a resolution. But if you want to come to a resolution and you want them to stop jerking you around and you want them to leave you alone, this is what you have to do because they're never going to leave you alone. They're never going to stop. You know, I, I, so many people come to me and they say, oh, we're still in court. It's five years later. They won't leave me alone. And I say, well, then you haven't figured out how what your diamond level supply is yet. You haven't figured out how to, you know, what your leverage is yet. I bet that part, figuring out your leverage, is the hardest part because you feel so spun around by the narcissist. So let me just see if I can track with you here. In your four-part framework for negotiating with a narcissist, it's slay. So remember, everybody? S is strategy. You have to have a vision of what you're looking for and that you want to get out of the relationship. And, and again, you have to have this going in or you're going to be spun around like a top. And the example that you gave, Rebecca, is my strategy is I'd like to sit next to them in a school function and discuss our child in a civil manner. The next step is L. And L is for leverage. And again, this has to do with that narcissistic supply. They're always going to want to feed their ego. This never ends. You've learned this. And you have to accept that as fact and then use your leverage to give them what they want, even if it makes you vomit later. And you're doing this. You're giving them the supply, the attention, the praise, the this, the that, the weekend trade that they're asking for. You're giving them that, even if it may, well, I don't want to have to do this. Why? So you can get what you want. And the reason why this is important is because when you supply them with something, what happens? You go into the cycle where they're nice to you. And lots of leverage, by the way, Rebecca is teaching you, comes down to giving them what they want, but also documenting what they say, what they do, and how many times you say something and how many times you do something. And why do you need the documentation, especially if you're in sort of a confrontational kind of thing? Uh, and you don't have to be in court for this, by the way. This might be that you constantly argue with your parents about who's hosting the holidays. Keep a record. Keep a record so you have proof. I'm dead serious about this because this comes down to leverage and to supply, right? And this also keeps you from going crazy. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that when you give them something, they're in a good mood so you can sneak in what you want. See how this works? I love this. 
So now that we understand the strategy and the leverage, A comes next. And you say, Rebecca, you and I got to be able to be two steps ahead, always. You got to anticipate. Can you teach us what you mean by that? So A is where you can actually figure out the type of narcissist that you're dealing with because they will all act a little differently in negotiations. And so a, a covert narcissist is much more likely to use the flying monkeys and pretend like they're the nice one and I'm the victim and, you know, oh, poor me and all of that. A covert narcissists are going to be the first one if, if somebody has cancer to show up with the basket and be right at their side in the hospital and, you know, that sort of thing, but smearing everybody on the side, you know, so you know you just have to be careful of who you're dealing with and then um the anticipation is that also that knowing that they're going to try to bait you i always say they go fishing they go and then they they reel you in like this and then once they have you you're in the mud and you're down there that makes a lot of sense so what's the final part of the four-part slay framework the why, which is you, which is you standing in your authentic power for you on the offensive. And then also your mindset, because a hundred percent of winning is your mindset. And if you don't believe you can win, nobody can help you. And, you know, I have so many people who have said to me, you know, that I can't win or I can't do this or whatever. And I always say to people, do you want to be right about that? Or do you actually want to win? Because you can be right or you can actually get out of this and win, but you can't have both, right? The good news is that there is a way to deal with them. You know, most people think that there's not. Most people say you can't negotiate with a narcissist. You can't deal with a narcissist. There's nothing you can do that it's pointless. It's hopeless. The good news is that there is actually a framework. It is actually pretty simple. They are actually pretty simple to understand. And that once you get on the other side of it and you stand up to them and you, you grab that power, the freedom that you feel, the feeling that you feel is actually beyond better than anything else. The people who I've helped through my programs are so powerful now. I, I actually now have master coaches who are becoming, you know, they're, they're graduating from my coaching program now. And it, it is beyond anything else that's more magical and more powerful than ever. That's the the beautiful thing you and you alone define your value you can win